Local presentation of the series television on KQED is made possible in part by a grant from Ampex Corporation, America's leading producer of television studio equipment located right here in the Bay Area. Ampex also supplies tape, data recorders, and computer terminals to customers worldwide. And by a grant from Circuit City. Circuit City, the nation's largest retailer of brand name consumer electronics and appliances, is proud to support public broadcasting in the Bay Area. When we watch television news, often it is the pictures that tell a story far more than words. Pictures of war. And peace. Pictures of survival. And human desolation. Terrorism. Political assassination. Mass murder. Images of a nation held hostage. Images of inspiration. Remarkable, sometimes horrifying images are transmitted almost instantaneously to billions of people around the world, affecting the way we think and live. That is the power of television news, the power of pictures. Television is funded by a major grant from MCI, offering a vast network of fiber optic and advanced digital technology for today's telecommunication needs. MCI, communications for the next hundred years. Additional funding was provided by this and other public television stations, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the Marilyn M. Simpson Charitable Trust. Hello, I'm Edwin Newman. This week on television, the first of two programs that will look at some aspect of the power of television news. The subject of great personal interest to me, for more than 30 years I worked as a correspondent for NBC News and I covered many of the stories we'll be seeing in these programs. Now it is a well-known fact that more people get their news from television than from any other medium. As we'll see tonight, often the pictures that it shows are sensational and shocking. They are the video equivalent of the screaming headline without the substantive reporting needed to place a story in context. Television shapes the way we perceive events and in so doing it often interacts with and affects those events. Over the next hour we'll be taking a look at some instances in which television news has played a role in recent history. This is television, the power of pictures. Television news has the power to transmit the experience itself, rather than information about the experience. The power of pictures is symbolic rather than factual, and and you, it, it appeals to a different part of the brain. TV brings us the news instantly, with more power and drama than newspapers or radio. But with the speed and vivid images can come confusion and misinformation. It has been shown to be a medium of shock rather than a medium of explanation, of uh, exposure rather than exposition, uh, of emotion rather than of intellect. Um, this is because of its, uh, the intensity of its picture quality. It is a tabloid medium. Never was the power of pictures more profound than during four days in November 1963. The nightmare began with a voiceover bulletin interrupting an afternoon soap opera. <laughs> 
In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital. Then the return to Washington that night, uh, as they all got off the plane, the body was uh, very dramatic, of course. Mrs. Kennedy had made the trip from Dallas aboard the plane, accompanying the body of her husband. She had carried herself with dignity and restraint. Now very quickly back to Dallas Police Headquarters for a videotaped live camera scene of Lee Oswald as he was brought into another room for questioning. These people have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. You just heard uh, Oswald who said he did not shoot anybody. Now the casket. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 35th president of the United States, leaving the White House for the last time. Two days later, Sunday, Kennedy's body is taken to the Capitol to lie in state. Exhausted reporters have been covering events non-stop since Friday, with all regular programming suspended. This is Kennedy, Caroline, and John. And now the caisson and the casket are moving down the drive. At the same moment, television cameras cut to Dallas. This is the basement floor of the Dallas City Hall, and that's a scuffle on the basement floor. It's been concerned for targeting. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Here comes the ambulance. And uh, Oswald will be removed now. Within an hour of this latest barely believable shooting, four out of every five TV sets in America were tuned in. Mrs. Jackson Kennedy is and her daughter are walking up to the casket. It will be her last goodbye for today. Monday, the fourth day, was the funeral. Millions joined in a worldwide contemplation of mortality and watched a nation's solemn ritual of mourning. The cortege and the crying people along the way, I think the, the riderless horse, of course, is always impressive. <laughs> the, then the people, I think, the faces of people in, in the crowd and the realization of what uh, mass agony was really about. And then uh, that terrific shot that we had on a long lens of the dignitaries of De Gaulle's magnificent height uh, leading the way and the rest sort of around him. Television held the nation together. Nations which have a 40-year-old president shot from under them, almost lost, are in danger of disintegrating. I think it's broadcasting's finest hour, and I think it, it may have saved this country. Assassination became all too familiar. NBC interrupts its regular program schedule to bring you the following special report. April 1968. Martin Luther King, Jr. was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. Shot in the face as he stood alone on the balcony of his hotel room. He died in a hospital an hour later. I ask every citizen to reject the blind violence that has struck Dr. King, who lived by nonviolence. I pray that his family can find comfort in the memory of all he tried to do for the land he loved so well. His I words went unheeded. American cities it. erupted in violence. Two months later, another death. The cameras had come to report a political victory. Ladies and gentlemen, we've kept the air on because we've heard an alarming report that 
Robert Kennedy was shot. Oh, my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot and possibly shot in the head. He still has the gun. The gun is pointed at me right at this moment. I hope they can get the gun out of his hand. <laughs> Be very careful. Get the gun. Stay away from the gun. Stay away from the gun. His hand is frozen. Get his thumb. Take a hold of his thumb and break it if you have to. Just moments before, Kennedy had told his supporters... The country wants to move in a different direction. We want to deal with our own problems within our own country, and we want peace in Vietnam. <laughs> Television brought the Vietnam War into our living rooms on a nightly basis. New lightweight cameras could go anywhere. They produced close-up, sensational images of war. In the early days, the war was covered just as the American government desired. It was us against them, with all of democracy at stake. The sniper attack began when a medic was inside the hut where we are huddling, treating a baby with a bad rash. Now the snipers, two or three of them, maybe more, are receiving return fire from automatic weapons. There's a building on fire several hundred meters away. Walter Cronkite arrived and gave the war his approval. Well, Colonel, <laughs> it's a great way to go to war. Yes, sir. I mean, pretty good mission. Do you think it was a good mission? Uh, yes, I think we got some good accomplished. The uh, people that were down there certainly knew we dropped some bombs in in a pretty close area. A mission about 70 miles from Da Nang Air Base here, a mission with the B-57s. A mission like all missions for these fellows, uh, except uh, we were lucky today. We didn't draw any enemy fire, uh, but we uh, did blast, we hope, some Viet Cong in their jungle hideouts. And that's the way it is here at Da Nang Air Base with the B-57s. Every day, crews were sent out to find the war. Bang Bang coverage, producers and correspondents called it. Vietnamese ambulance chasing. It was compelling TV, but deceptive. With rare exceptions, no one was taking a close look at the how and why of Vietnam. I've got uh, issue one, two on the line. Where do you want him? On uh, this wood line over here, sir. Uh, grab, the, grab your horn there. Identify the exact target area to him. Give him uh, coordinates. Now you can probably see the flame for one thing in a smoke, but give me the coordinates. American viewers saw the real experience of war transformed into theatrics on the 21-inch screen. Never mind the complexities of Southeast Asian politics, television said we were winning. January 1968, different images, images of defeat too powerful to ignore. The Tet Offensive, the enemy's full-scale attack. The enemy's well-coordinated attacks occurred throughout South Vietnam, but the most dramatic demonstration of his boldness came at the very symbol of America's presence in Vietnam, the brand new U.S. Embassy building there. CBS News correspondent Robert Shackney reports. Military police got back into the compound of the two and a half million dollar embassy complex at dawn. Before that, a platoon of Viet Cong were in control. All told, five Americans were killed during the day. The Tet Offensive ultimately failed, but the Viet Cong's ability to attack without warning cities thought to be impregnable was a tremendous shock. And that same awful week, we learned of an entire Marine division surrounded on a hillside at Khe San. close the door without hesitation. Get ready to go. We don't need to clean the cabin up or anything. All we want to do is close that lower door and start. TV newsmen braved barrages of North Vietnamese shells to send the story of Khe San to America.
dropping two now, right in those trees. He will. One gruesome image from the Tet Offensive stands out from all the rest. The Viet Cong suspect was captured in Saigon and summarily executed on camera. This film and the newspaper front page pictures revolted the nation. What was this war turning us into? What kind of people allowed such things to happen? Television pictures were disturbing. Public opinion was moving. TV reflected the change. Here was a major offensive that we had been told they weren't capable of mounting. So as soon as it broke, uh, we here discussed the matter and it was decided that we would do something rather unique and rather daring, as a matter of fact, uh, and risky. And that's that I would step out of my role as uh, impartial newscaster and go out there and do a sort of first-person impressions of Vietnam. Report from Vietnam. By Walter Seen Clinton. by only a handful of viewers, this broadcast had an important effect. And the communist intention was to take and seize the cities. They came closer here at way than anywhere else. And now, three weeks after the offensive began, the firing still goes on from here on the new side of the city and across the Perfume River to the old side, the Citadel. Next in his tour of the battle zones, Cronkite took a critical look at the bloodshed in Quezon. Quezon was designed to be a small border stronghold, but for reasons of U.S. pride, Quezon has been built up into a major bastion where 5,500 Marines are isolated. It was Cronkite's summing up that rattled the decision makers in Washington. It is increasingly clear to this reporter that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. This is Walter Cronkite. Good night. I concluded that uh, we couldn't win. I concluded that we ought to say we've done the very best we can. We tried. Uh, it didn't work and get out. Cut out going to reduce. We are reducing, substantially reducing. Not going to, and one thing you say you've ordered it, and the next day you're going to order it. You get that, Jim? Yeah. Mark it on your outfit over there. This is Lyndon Johnson rehearsing for a television speech six weeks after the pictures of the Tet Offensive and Cronkite's special report. It was the most important speech he ever made on television, so we wanted it right. We are reducing, substantially reducing, the present level of hostilities, and we're doing so unilaterally. Tonight, I have ordered an aircraft and naval vessel. Uh, wait a minute. Tonight, back up. Accordingly, I shall not see, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I think it had a lot to do with Lyndon Johnson deciding that he wasn't going to run for re-election. He felt that, that uh, Walter's broadcast had, uh, had really cut the ground right out from under Johnson's position. I learned it only later uh, that he had apparently said, well, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America or something of the kind. Uh, I, I don't believe that that was the, uh, a deciding matter at all. I, I think it was just another drop of water uh, and a great torrent that was, uh, uh, was overwhelming uh, Lyndon Johnson at that point. People are human, and uh, they do identify with the people that bring the, the word and the news to them. And Walter had enormous credibility, and still has. Television was hardly the sole factor in Johnson's decision, but with TV news changing its tune on Vietnam, leaders like Dean Rusk were disturbed by the nightly depiction of the war's horror. War is the principal obscenity on the face of the human race. And uh, the impact of, of battle scenes on the ordinary citizen every day uh, was quite strong. One can reflect upon what might have happened in World War II if Dunkirk had been on television and the other side was not using it. I think the effect could have been very profound. So I think we need to do a good deal of thinking about whether or not an armed conflict can be sustained for very long if the worst aspects of it are going to be reflected on television every day. There may have to be certain kinds of censorship. Rusk's prophecy of censorship has come true on other battlefields. 
Britain's fight with Argentina over the Falcons in 1982 was a remarkable opportunity to send back pictures of the war live. Sophisticated video gear and satellite technology made that possible. The military planners of the British task force had other ideas. Television was dangerous. Well, the Vietnam syndrome was powerful in the task force going down. It certainly was on Hermes. If I talk to a commando or a squadron leader, he will still talk about you people in Vietnam having lost the Americans their war there. It wasn't CBS that uh, launched the Tet Offensive, it was the Viet Cong. But these people had it in their minds that because the Vietnam War was the most televised war in the world, ipso facto, any war that's televised is going to be lost. The first test of the military's restrictions came on the day HMS Sheffield was hit. This was the first major setback of the war. We tried to do all the things that we would normally have done in anybody else's war, and that was to go and film Sheffield on fire. And straight away, we weren't allowed to get on the helicopters. And I remember this man, when we wanted to file this story on Sheffield, was astonished. He said, but we don't want you to send bad news. Hasn't anyone told you that you're here to do a 1940s propaganda job? Lovely, pathy news. You know, there goes Tommy over the top to give Jerry a black eye. But that wasn't the role that we saw for ourselves. They were worried about the power of pictures. Pictures convey the realities of war to a degree which I think nobody speaking or writing can ever possibly convey, however skilled they are. Cameron finally got permission to go out three days after Shepard was hit. But he was only allowed to go out because Admiral Woodward couldn't go out himself. He wanted to see the extent of damage that an exo set had on a small frigate. And uh, he came back, he watched the video, and then confiscated the videotape. And that was then sent on to the MOD, and we were uh, given access to it a month later. With a lot of ingenuity and perseverance, British television sometimes managed to evade the clutches of military censors. With the help of sympathetic field commanders, TV was able to tell the story of the final assault on the Falcons' capital of Port Stanley. But it was still weeks before the public saw these pictures. Is there a white flag flying? There is a white flag flying over Stanley. <laughs> Bloody marvelous. <laughs> 1983, the Reagan administration, with memories of Vietnam and taking the cue from the British, banned press coverage of the invasion of Grenada. You have to turn around and head back north. You're not allowed to go to Grenada. I say again, turn around and head north. And that was reinforced shortly afterward when military aircraft made several low passes over our boat. Instead, the Army provided film, showing only what it wanted shown. The military took these pictures because the Reagan administration issued orders saying no reporters or camera crews would be allowed in to cover the invasion. And that decision is creating a battle of its own. I don't think in a democracy we want the government acting in our name unless we know what the government is doing. Uh, and I think we're entitled to know what the government is doing in order to, for us to be a monitor on our government. That's the way the system is supposed to work. The system can be subverted, the press manipulated. In 1968, starving children were used as propaganda weapons during the civil war between the African nation of Nigeria and the province of Biafra. How many would you say there are like that in the bush and in the villages? Oh, in the bush you just couldn't count them. The villagers that we're seeing in the clinic are countless numbers and we can't even admit because we don't have the beds. Would you say there were thousands upon thousands of children like I would like say this? thousands of children like this, yes. The power of horrifying pictures from Vietnam was not lost on the Biafran government. The Biafrans hired a Swiss public relations firm. They convinced foreign television crews that 50,000 children were dying each day. We had never seen children starving quite like this before on British television screens, had we? I got these statistics from a, uh, a, a father, a Catholic father who was working out there as a missionary, who believed these statistics that they were given to him by Caritas. And Caritas got them from Mark Press, their public relations people in, in, in Switzerland. And then were broadcast by people like myself. The number of children dying were nowhere near the number we said it was. Children did die. Maybe it doesn't matter if it's, it was only 5,000 who died a day and not 50,000. If a dozen were dying a day and we said 50,000, so God will forgive us. Five children is still five too many to die. But we did get it wrong in many ways. 
We were the victim, as we always are in our profession, of deliberate misinformation, propaganda, and I'm afraid the young guys, the new guys, as I was then, young and new, uh, took it. Naturally, television was a prime target in the propaganda war being fought by both Biafra and Nigeria. One day, Mike Nicholson and others stumbled on a Nigerian patrol questioning a prisoner. What happened next was a tragic attempt to manipulate TV, an echo from the streets of Saigon. But you're not a Biafran soldier. Yeah. Are you looking for who? My parents. Where mother, are mother and father. Children. Because we have come to one Nigeria that have killed my parents. Come in. Come in. Huh? They have killed my parents. The journalists on the scene were convinced this execution was deliberately staged for the camera of Britain's independent television news. And it did not end there. When ITN telecast the film, there was outrage around the world. To counteract the bad publicity, Nigeria decided to execute the officer responsible for the murder. They invited the world press to film his shooting. ITN refused. In a wide sweep around Mekele, the people lie without food, without water, and without hope. Most relief Fifteen years later, TV cameras again captured the sights and sounds of tragedy in Africa. The food has almost run out. No one knows when the next will arrive. Most Americans were unaware of the human devastation in Ethiopia until this British report was broadcast on NBC. Inside, the barracks have become charnel houses. There's nothing for these people. Nothing for this man except death. It happened only minutes after we arrived. There was nobody to help him. He died with only his daughter left to grieve for him. TV pictures can help mobilize action. In America, the civil rights movement had been a major news story since the mid-50s. As TV's ability to cover events improved, it was able to tell the entire country about the efforts of Martin Luther King and others to end discrimination. In the history of television in America, it was probably the first uh, major story. It was an unfolding drama between 1955 and 1965. It was a great little drama in this country, in the civil rights movement, and it took the, the media of television to capture uh, that drama, and it did it, and it did it well. When you had people who believed in the discipline of nonviolence prepared to sit at a lunch counter all day and not be served in an orderly, peaceful fashion, when the people around this country saw young people being beaten uh, by hootlands uh, while they were seeking the right to vote, that was a sense of righteous indignation. We had five to six hundred elderly black men and women prepared to stand in front of a courthouse in the rain all day waiting to become registered voters. Keep people from standing inside. What you're really trying to do is intimidate these people and by making them stand in the rain, keep them from registering to vote. And this is a kind of violation of the Constitution. You can turn your back on me, but you cannot turn your back upon the idea of justice. You can turn your back now and you can keep the club in your hand, but you cannot beat down just. Television had to capture them. And they showed the film. They told the story. And the American people reacted. The effect of these scenes brought into our homes via television was one of shock. Violence created a sense of national shame. You saw Martin Luther King and the civil rights marches and children being forbidden by police dogs. It changed history.
until Dr. King started his sit-ins and his marches and so forth, there was just really no possibility of getting any legislation through the Senate. The fact that a lot of people got aroused who probably wouldn't have been aroused but for the television. We will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. When television is reporting events that are filmed rather than just discussing events, it has an impact that I think is far greater than than, uh, than radio or, uh, or newspapers. The cameras were there at yet another dramatic moment. In March of 1965, in uh, Selma, Alabama, as I tried to lead a group of about 600 people across the bridge from Selma to Montgomery to dramatize uh, to the state of Alabama and to the nation that black people wanted the right to register to vote, the right to participate in the democratic process. This is unlawful assembly. You been for television on that day. The national news, we probably wouldn't have got the Voting Rights Act in 1965. I think what happened there did uh, capture the imagination of people all over this country and around the world. Uh, I was beaten and left lying unconscious. I think the civil rights movement in America owe a great deal uh, to television. The power of pictures for the civil rights marchers was not lost on the anti-Vietnam War movement. Televised demonstrations helped solidify opinion, both pro and con, almost as much as pictures from the battle lines. Television was influencing these events. Demonstrators, like this woman, seemed to be performing for the camera. In close-up, this looks like an angry mob. Pull the camera back and it becomes less threatening. Television can be a distorting mirror. I think that television did a lot. I think the whole protest movement has been aided by getting the story a broader circulation than it could have ever had with print or with radio. We had been raised and brought up with television, so it was just part of our technological milieu where it wasn't for the generals and the Pentagon and the people making decisions in the White House. It was as natural for us as using the telephone or, or getting on, uh, you know, airplanes and flying around. And with George McGovern as president of the United States. August 1968, Chicago, the Democratic National Convention. Mayor Richard Daley tried to keep cameras off the streets away from the anti-war protests. But the networks got the story, cutting the shots of police battling demonstrators even while the convention continued inside the hall. All of these state banners are being held high now, the state markers here, except those of three states, as nearly as we can tell, four states, Nebraska, California, Colorado, and Wisconsin, banners are not up. Realizing that these scenes of violence were being televised, the demonstrators began chanting, the whole world is watching, the whole world is watching. Well, that was a chant that came quite spontaneously out of the crowd. We knew that uh, some cataclysmic event uh, was happening in American life, and uh, the brutality of the police uh, was being witnessed all over the world. These people the mayhem spilled over to the floor of the convention. Mayor Daley's lieutenants were determined to squelch dissent. Take your hands off of me. Unless you intend to arrest me, don't, don't push me, please. I know you will, but don't push me. Take your hands off of me unless you plan to arrest me. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, Walter, you can see. I don't know what's going on, but this, these are security people, apparently, around Dan. 
Walter was obviously getting rough. We tried to talk to the man, and we got uh, bodily pushed out of the way. This is the kind of thing that's been going on outside the hall. This is the first time we've had it happen inside the hall. We, uh, I'm sorry to be out of breath, but somebody belted me in his stomach doing that. What happened is a Georgia delegate, at least he had a Georgia delegate sign on, was uh, being hauled out of the hall. We tried to uh, talk to him to see why, who he was, and what the situation was. And at that instant, the security people, uh, well, as you can see, put me on the deck. <laughs> I didn't do very well. I think we've got a bunch of thugs here, Dan. The networks were bombarded with phone calls. Many condemned the police. Others said showing the protest gave comfort to the enemy. Some seemed to think TV was responsible for the violence. Lyndon Johnson was furious. Scenes of chaos in Chicago dealt a serious blow to the chances of his chosen successor, Hubert Humphrey. LBJ took his complaints right to the top. He called me the night of the difficulties in the 68 convention. He made some pretty strong comments that night. I can't, I can't bring them back verbatim, but they were certainly the thrust of them were, was that we were, uh, that we were not doing right by the country. The leaders in the country, the decision makers in the, in the big corporations, they were not aware of the power of television. They were, not, they were not aware of the impact of visual images. They were not aware of what they were doing in terms of putting these images on the air. At the same time, across the world, TV images from Czechoslovakia were raising the hackles of other politicians. Politicians watching warily from Moscow. By Western standards, these Czech TV pictures were not very remarkable. But the Soviets, used to total control of the news, were alarmed. When Dubček became first secretary of the party, censorship went by the board. And from then on, journalists felt absolutely free to interview whoever they like in the way they like. Czechoslovak television annoyed the Russians a few times. A uh, television journalist, colleague of mine, went to Karlovy Valley, the famous bar, where Premier Kosygin was. And she approached him on the promenade there and uh, started asking him questions. Well, he was completely taken aback. Nothing like that had ever happened to him. And, uh, of course, he didn't handle that very adroitly. In one broadcast, and it was a live broadcast, you had about five people around the table and they included a former political prisoner and his jailer. And these two uh, came into contact, conversation. During what became known as the Prague Spring, television was broadcasting live, no holds barred meetings. Topics like the secret police and censorship were openly discussed. Even changes in the Communist Party were debated without fear of reprisal. Another type of program was a series where the interviewee had no idea about what he was going to be asked. Now, before that, uh, people in public life, ministers, uh, officials of the uh, Communist Party, etc., had always not only been warned about what they were going to be asked, but had, had prepared scripts which they would have uh, read out. Two weeks before the invasion, Soviet leaders had a final meeting with the Czechs at a railway station on the border. Leonid Brezhnev brought up the subject of television. When the Soviet leaders needed to stress some point, they would take transcripts of television broadcasts and throw them in front of Dubček or of the others and ask him, now what do you say about that? On such and such a day, you broadcasted this, that, and the other. Uh, so they, they were using the transcripts of these broadcasts as a kind of stick to beat the Czechoslovak leadership into submission. When the invasion came, Czech TV cameras covered the event live. For television, it was a sad first. Throughout the long day, Russian troops would close down transmitters only to find a clandestine news studio on the air hours later. Commentators grew weary, pictures grew fainter, finally the signals disappeared. In 
If you would seek further evidence of the power of pictures, look to the revolution in the Philippines in 1986. Control of that nation's television stations was critical. What's more, TV crews from around the world were there to cover the story, and many believe that their presence helped to keep violence to a minimum. Conversely, consider the situation in South Africa. When the government there banned the reporting of demonstrations and violent racial clashes, people could no longer see the pictures, and international outrage diminished. The role of news organizations as monitors of government is crucial. Perhaps at no time in our recent history has this been so evident as during the years of Watergate. The intense adversarial relationship between Richard Nixon and the press was an old one, as vividly demonstrated at a famous press conference in 1962. Just think how much you're going to be messy. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Because, gentlemen, this is my last press conference. In 1968, and, uh, just six years one, later, uh, Nixon was back. Which, this time, he said, it was a new Nixon. Nobody's going to package me. Uh, nobody's going to make me put on an act for television. I'm not going to engage in any gimmicks or any stunts, wear any silly hats, uh, do something for the purpose of getting a publicity picture or the rest. I, I am not an actor. I'm not a good actor. I'm just going to be myself. Reserve, protect, and defend. Reserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. After Nixon was elected, I'm told that President Johnson had a long meeting with him out in the West in which he told him the difficulties that Johnson had had with television. President Johnson uh, told him that uh, the quicker Nixon got on top of it, the better off he'd be. Nixon was very clear in his desire to do as much as he could to control the use of television. Nixon had used television well in his 68 campaign, but he could not keep TV away when the going got rough. There are great differences between those who are seeking the office for the presidency today. Is it not fair and relevant to question this concentration of power in the hands of a tiny enclosed fraternity of privileged men elected by no one and enjoying a monopoly sanctioned and licensed by government? Within a year of his election, Nixon had Vice President Spiro Agnew attack the power of television. ...represent the views of America. As with other American institutions, perhaps it is time that the networks were made more responsive to the views of the nation and more responsible to the people they serve. It was done in order to cause us to be frightened, I guess, to a lot of people, you know, who uh, think we're unfair. A lot of people think that bad news is the news that we make, you know. Not that we report it, but we're actually responsible for it. What's the matter with the television? Everything I see on there is bad. Why do you only do bad things? They, they forget that all we do is to represent what has happened. When five burglars were caught inside the Watergate building in June 1972, there were no cameras present. For months, it only made headlines in the Washington Post and a few other newspapers. I think for the first time, we're, we're starting to see the general outlines of, of the whole conspiracy and the subsequent cover-up. Five men. It was another special report by Walter Cronkite that brought Watergate onto front pages across the country. The episode grew steadily more sinister, no longer a caper, but the Watergate affair, escalating finally into charges of a high-level campaign of political sabotage and espionage apparently unparalleled in American history. But neither TV nor the newspapers could keep Nixon from a landslide re-election. I would only hope that in these next four years, we can so conduct ourselves in this country and so meet our responsibilities in the world, in building peace in the world, that years from now, people will look back to the generation of the 1970s at how we've conducted ourselves. And they will say, God bless America. 
The White House cover-up very nearly succeeded, but people started to talk. For weeks, the Senate Watergate hearings provided the most riveting drama on television. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency, and if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. I also told him that it was important that this cancer be removed immediately because it was growing more deadly every day. In self-defense, Nixon was forced to appear on TV again and again. The picture showed a president who did not perform well under pressure. Viewers refused to accept his explanations. Could you tell us your uh, personal reaction to uh, the discovery that the Dean and Mitchell tapes did not exist? Well, my personal reaction was one of very great disappointment because I wanted the evidence out. And I knew that when there was any indication that something didn't exist, immediately there would be the impression that some way either the president, or more likely perhaps somebody on the president's staff, knew there was something on those tapes that it wouldn't be wise to get out. When he was filmed angrily shoving press secretary Ron Ziegler, Nixon seemed to be disintegrating before the eyes of the audience. Still, he persisted in using television. The picture it presented was destroying him. Sir, uh, last week in your speech, you referred to those who would exploit Watergate to keep you from doing your job. Could you specifically detail who those are? I would suggest that uh, where the shoe fi fits, people should well, uh, wear it. Uh, I would think that some, some political figures uh, some uh, members of the press, perhaps, uh, some members of the television, uh, perhaps would exploit it. Uh, I don't impute, interestingly enough, uh, it, it motives, however, that uh, are improper interest. Because here's what is involved. There are a great number of people in this country that would prefer that I do resign. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes. I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. And when he said in that Saturday night speech, I'm not a crook, I'm not a crook, I think the verdict of the American people and of history was the opposite of what he was saying. When you hear, Rob, people who love this country and people who believe in you say reluctantly that uh, perhaps you should uh, resign or be impeached. Well, I'm glad we don't take the vote of this room, let me say. In favor, signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no. Nixon had tried to control television. By the time articles of impeachment were voted, aye. the world was watching him fall on television. Aye. Mr. Edwards. Aye. Mr. Hungate. Aye. Still, Nixon might have managed to tough it out. He was finally done in by the revelation of one more tape, the smoking gun that proved his complicity without a doubt. Mr. Flower. Aye. These are, with no serious doubt, the last hours of the 37th presidency of the United States. Other presidents, including Washington, were tempted to resign. None did. Resignation with dignity is the only safe and civilized way remaining to transfer the power. The only alternative was trial and conviction. All but certain for the past couple of weeks, absolutely certain since Monday's admission of guilt and the obstruction of justice. And now from the Oval Office at the White House, the President of the United States. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office where so many decisions have been made that shape the history of this nation. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president 
at that hour in this office. Is there dynamite on the plane that you know of? I rather think there is. Have they threatened to blow you up? No, no, they haven't mentioned anything at all about that whatsoever. Both government and television have so far failed to come to grips with terrorism. Dramatic images draw TV like a moth to a flame, so it has become a prime terrorist target. 1970, Palestinian guerrillas hijack three jets to Jordan. Mike Nicholson's cameraman guarantees a worldwide scoop. We had a freelance cameraman there who was a lawyer, and he said, you better come, they're going to release the hostages. And so we went, and we did our interviews with the hostages, and, and I was just about to leave. And he said, no, 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 no don't go yet. I said, no, I must get back. We've got to film, get this film off to uh, Beirut. You know, it's got to be shipped. He said, no, no, don't, you mustn't go. Uh, so I stood with him, and he started to run his camera. And within 10 seconds, the aircraft blew up. And we're used to cameramen switching off at the wrong time. This guy switched on at the right time. And I said, how, how did you do that? He said, because I'm one of them. He was a Palestinian, unknown to us. He'd been a Fedayeen all the time. It was marvelous propaganda. The whole of the Dawson's Field escapade was a propaganda exercise. The guerrillas got what they wanted, attention. Arab guerrillas are still holding inside the rooms of the Israeli Olympic team nine people, one of them believed dead. There is the scene, this is a live picture you're looking at right now, that room in the end, and there again is the head of one of the guerrillas, the lookout, who has been coming out from time to time. Two years later, the Palestinians went for the biggest TV audience in the world at the Munich Olympic Games. Suddenly, the huge television operation swung from sports to terror. You can see from time to time that man step out of the balcony. He banged on the door, he gained access, he talked briefly with a man who heretofore has been downstairs at the street level and has been acting as the go-between between various German organizing delegates that have arrived and spoken to them. This young man you can see on the camera perhaps now in that balcony has now kept that lookout vigil for eight hours. It is of course impossible to tell what they are thinking, but one thing they might surely be doing is watching the events and hearing the events of the day on German television for all of the rooms in the Olympic vision do have television. In the years since the Munich tragedy, the power of pictures has continued to be an essential element of political terror. Tehran, November 1979. Militant students seize the United States Embassy and take 53 hostages. The crisis will last 444 days. Good evening, the hostages... For the first six weeks, Iran is the lead story on all three networks taking up two-thirds of the 22 minutes allotted to stories on the evening news. A whole new program, ABC's Nightline, evolves from the demand for information. The students know how to use television. The crowd outside the embassy chants in English for American TV crews and French for a French crew. Cameras leave, so does the crowd. The militants inside the embassy bargain with the networks for interviews and film of the hostages. Friends in the United States monitor the coverage and report back to the students. Saturation coverage stokes American outrage and puts pressure on the Carter administration. A disastrous attempt is made to rescue the hostages with a scenario straight out of Mission Impossible. The networks ease back on their coverage. Some believe that it is only at this point that serious negotiations for release begin. The hostages are finally freed. He has pulled a hand grenade pin and he is ready to blow up the aircraft if he has to. We must, I repeat, we must land at Beirut. The TWA hijacking in June 85 was another example of how television news can become a featured player in a staged terrorist drama. Press conferences called by the hijackers and the Amal militia featuring statements from the hostages degenerated into the proverbial media circus. Please, yeah. please, gentlemen, please be quiet and act like gentlemen. Again, the hijackers were media savvy. They understood pool coverage and arranged convenient picture opportunities. Anchormen functioned as go-betweens. Earlier, when I talked with Barry himself, he continued to express qualified optimism. 48 hours from now. Within 48 hours from now, you think something... Let's, let's say it's 
let's say it clear that I am waiting for answer about what I, what I said in, uh, I already said in my press conference. Right. TV was accused of getting in the way of diplomacy and of feeding fuel to the fire of world terrorism. Others said TV prevented the crisis from escalating and kept the passengers alive. In any hostage situation, it is important to keep the captors talking, and that television did. Again, the ending was a happy one. But the combination of available technology and cutthroat competition can result in network overkill. All too often, television is an eye, but not a brain. TV pictures can be so vivid and immediate that sometimes little thought may be given to the background of a story or its implications. Most network analysis is reserved for those moments when there are no pictures to show. Now, that may be changing. More and more, local stations and services like the cable news network are able to trot around the globe just as ABC, CBS, and NBC can. Eventually, what may set the networks apart is their ability to provide reliable, authoritative reporting on national and international affairs. Now, TV news budget cutbacks are another reason that longer, deeper pieces and commentary may become more plentiful. They're cheaper to produce. Why not ask for the best from television news? Powerful pictures and consistently fine journalism. For television, I'm Edwin Newman. And we have startling television for you ahead this Monday evening. We continue to make history. Next tonight, it's Crime Incorporated, the mob at work, and the connection between organized crime and union pension funds at nine, followed by Frontline, the mind of a murderer, the story of the hillside strangler of Los Angeles, what took this all-American boy into these dastardly paths. That'll be tonight at 10 o'clock. Tonight's history of television will be shown again Sunday, Sunday evening at 6.30 next week. And next week on television, it'll be News Point of View, a brief survey of the early history of American television news, from the Joseph McCarthy hearings through the manipulation of current political candidates. That'll be at 8 o'clock next Monday night. By the way, if you'd like to see how television treats Hollywood stars, Steve McQueen and John Wayne are profiled Wednesday evening at 9 and 10 o'clock, respectively. Later this week, it's those who hope to be political stars, the Texas primary debates, with Thursday and, evening, uh, Thursday and Friday evening coverage at 11 o'clock, the Democrats and Republicans, respectively, Thursday and Friday evenings here on Channel 9 this week. Television is funded by a major grant from MCI, offering a global highway for voice and data services around the corner or around the world. MCI, communications for the next hundred years. Additional funding was provided by this and other public television stations, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the Marilyn M. Simpson Charitable Trust. A companion book to the television series has been written by Michael Winship and is available in bookstores and libraries.